I'm going to find a slide just to help people as they come in. That would be. So what's what is uh, new in the world of research in terms of um, transition and and what either I bet most of it is like take all the research that's been done and put it into practice. Parents, parents are important. We know that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Are you following the um, the bill, the high school and beyond bill that's in the legislature right now? Yeah. It hasn't, I haven't looked at the last couple of days. Has there been any movement? I think it's been moving. That's to make like a standardized software or something. Is that right? Mm, I'm not familiar with that part. I thought it was looking at uh, the accepting projects as part of the. Oh, oh, kind of more. It might that. be more than one because there's a, there seem to be, yeah. there's a lot of attention to this area. Yeah. There Just is. cool. Um, yeah, that mastery based. I know Wellman's the, big on that uh, mastery based. Yeah, Wellman loves the mastery based stuff. Which I, you know, at my my sister was the kind of kid who um, threw up at when there were the big in the big tests. So I, I don't think that one big test is necessarily a really great way to identify that someone mm -hmm. has a mastery of the product or or the information. Yeah, there's such a fine line between lowering the standards for students yeah. with versus, you know, rigorous instruction. And it's it's tough. Yeah, there really is. The, um, I was just watching an, an inclusion webinar yesterday where they were trying really hard to explain the difference between those things like periodic table. But sorry, the periodic table example they gave, I thought was yes. great. Was, that was so that really stuck with me. Yeah. Right. The focusing on that was so interesting. Focusing order. on what's the goal. Yeah. We're with what they were. There's an order. There's a system. Yeah. It's like, oh, I yeah. understood the periodic table better after that conversation. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. And that there was totally. heavy light and, and matter matters or what is matter. Yeah. Yeah. If you know what, right. You know what the goal Which, is. Like, you know I mean, I. Right. Yeah. If you know and then it helps mean, even the kids. Like, I think if. If someone had put it that way to me, it would have made it easier to actually learn the elements, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think, Krista, you're addressing what, what the whole critical piece is, is if you know what it is that you want students to learn, then you can change up the way you teach and you can change up the way they demonstrate their knowledge, but they still hit that goal. And, you know, that's it's hard for some teachers to figure that out. Yeah, I mean, and they need training and practice and... Those are hard things to come by. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you. It's like the periodic table, they changed up how they presented it. And if they changed up how you were tested or demonstrated knowledge, then be like, oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. And the, the grading is a lot easier when you know that. You know, I think that's been the right. big thing for teachers. You know, they they try different things and they want the student to pass and the grade doesn't really mean anything and the certificate of mastery doesn't really mean anything because it depends upon, you know, how what things are going on. So when you've got that really clear, you know, like students with IEPs have the right to fail only mm -hmm. if we've done everything we can on both sides. It's I not, love that. Yeah. Students with IEPs have the right to fail. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that when it's come to um, doing homework, there's been so many things where I'm like, I got enough on my hands. I am not going to help him with homework. Just, it's like, even trying to get the, all the PT exercises or the, or the speech language stuff. It's just like, and I care. I just also, it's like, I'm trying to get him to unload the dishwasher and brush his teeth and get himself dressed for bed and it's like okay all right we're at seven yeah oh it, my clock must be fine okay just well then I will not be going well let, let me do this okay will you start letting people in oh well, that's gonna be rude but okay uh darn I was gonna just this one thing okay I'll just I'll just wing it okay Hi, everyone. 
we're going to uh, start in about a minute um, as we wait for, give a little bit of time for people to join us in the I evening. Shirt on. Okay. Remember to mute. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we are recording this for people who cannot attend, encourage you to share it. Um, yeah, if you get an opportunity, we will be getting it on our website. Although frankly, <laughs> we're volunteers and while it'd be lovely to say that it's gonna be up there tomorrow, I don't know when it'll be on their website. Um, I'm Cheryl Lynn Crowther. I'm the president of the Seattle Special Education PTSA. And while we're waiting for people to join, I'll also say there's always an opportunity for you to become a member um, and help in uh, provide your voice and uh, and help with our different costs. It's a lot of our we keep all of our programs free, um, but our guide to special education that we developed had costs for interpretation, translation, and printing. Christy, if you get a chance, or if someone else who is on the board could just drop in a link to our guide, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Uh, looks like it's a little after, so let's uh, let's go ahead and start. I'm going to work on keeping our, our intros a little short. Uh, again, I'm Cheryl Lynn Crowther. I am the president of the Seattle Special Education PTSA, and I am pleased to um, be hosting this group on effective transitions. Uh, I will acknowledge that the land I'm sitting on, that I'm coming from, is the um, traditional Coast Salish people's land, the unceded, and continues to be for the folks that were on this land from time immemorial. Uh, and we as a PTSA recognize that in our land acknowledgement and I encourage people to also look into some of the land back movement when we really talk about how the um, first peoples of this land um, can be reunited with it. Uh, one way to do that is with pay real rent with uh, for the Duwamish. And we do these different programs, If you, whether you found us on Eventbrite or on Seattle Special Education's PTSA's, our calendar, which you can subscribe to for your through Gmail, um, or follow us on Eventbrite. We do a lot of different programming. Um, this particular one is uh, going to be of interest to anybody who's starting to think about transition. And as we'll hear, transition conversations can start as early as seventh grade. Um, and I will be keenly interested. I have a 12th grader and have felt frustrated. So uh, I am going to go ahead and uh, just hand this over to Cinda. Cinda or, or Cinda or Jay? I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank Great. you so much, Sherlyn. Yeah, thank you for that introduction um, and for inviting us to be here this evening. We've got a um, the majority of the CCTS team here tonight. I'm looking forward to introducing you all. Am I sharing the right screen? Is everyone seeing the right screen here? Okay, great, thank you, great. Um, my name is Jay Shepard, and I am the Director of Digital Content and Accessibility at the Center for Change and Transition Services. And I use both they and she pronouns, both are good. And for those of you who might not be able to see me this evening, I am a middle-aged white person with short brown hair, brown eyes, glasses, and dimples. So also here with me this evening are Dr. Cinda Johnson, our principal investigator, Elaine Marcinic, our director and co-investigator, and Julia Schutz, our project coordinator. Uh, so I'll be handing things over to Cinda very shortly to talk us through uh, the majority of the content this evening, and Julia and Elaine will be keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, so we'll start tonight with a brief overview of who we are at CCTS, and then explore the components of transition planning. So we'll look at the transition services flowchart, which includes age-appropriate transition assessments, measurable post-secondary goals, transition services, the course of study, the annual goals, and then finally agency connections. 
And then before we wrap up, we'll talk briefly about how to align the IEP transition plan and the high school and beyond plan. Both of those are graduation requirements for students with disabilities. And then we'll be sure to leave time at the end of the presentation today for questions. But if questions do come up during the presentation, feel free to enter those in the chat. And uh, if we can address them as we go along, we will. Just be mindful of confidentiality when you're entering information in the chat this evening. And do remember that this meeting is being recorded. So I'll start uh, with a brief introduction to who we are at CCTS. Uh, our mission at CCTS is to empower educators to improve transition services for students with disabilities. And we are one of eight state needs projects in Washington State that are funded by the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And we're located at Seattle University in the College of Education. And at CCTS, we provide secondary transition training and technical assistance to our Washington State agencies that we partner with and public schools who are serving high school age students. And then we're also responsible for managing and reviewing the district reported post school outcome data. You may have heard of a survey or a lever survey. So we help manage and administer that. And we'll talk a little bit about where you can access those data if you're interested at the end of the presentation. All of the materials that we generate are available on our website, and they are designed for educators and administrators, agency staff, but also youth with disabilities and their families and caregivers. Um, we do not provide direct services such as transition assessments or attending IEP meetings, that sort of thing. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cinda to uh, get us started with the components of transition planning. Thank you, Jay, and welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to meet with you tonight and thank you for having us. We are so appreciative of parents and families and we know that you are a very critical piece in the transition planning and services for your child. So we hope you take something away from this tonight and that um, you learn something new. So let's get started. So transition services begin the year the student turns age 16. And this is for all students with IEPs. So thinking about the conversation beforehand, I wanna make sure everyone knows these are students with just uh, speech and language services perhaps, or health impairment or significant intellectual disabilities. It's every student with an IEP begins at age 16. And it is required by state and federal law that transition services are included in the IEP. This intentional flow that you're looking at here starts with, as most things do in special education, assessment. It's called the age appropriate transition assessment. And the results of this ass assessment informs what's called the measurable post-secondary goals, which are the activities that follow after leaving high school. And once that happens, we identify transition services, a course of study is written, and we write annual IEP goals. These activities create an effective IEP that's designed by and for the student so that they can make a successful transition to life after high school. The transition components of the IEP becomes the framework for the rest of the IEP. And we believe, I believe, that transition, the transition plan should be written first. So it is also revisited and adjusted each year at the annual IEP meeting, and it's based on new data and present levels of performance, as is the entire IEP. So let's look at the flow chart. On this slide, we see that the transition components in a flow chart start from what we talked about previously. The flow chart here also includes several subcomponents that have been added to the first three sections of this sequence. In conducting the age-appropriate transition assessment, the purpose is to help the student identify their strengths, preference, interests, and needs. And we're gonna get into this a little bit further as we move through this tonight. Under writing measurable post-secondary goals, there needs to be goals written in the areas of education and training and employment, and if considered necessary by the IEP team, which includes the family, independent living goals. Under identifying transition services, specially designed instruction, any necessary related services, 
community experiences, employment and living skills need to be addressed to support the progress towards reaching that post-secondary goal. And then the next step is to develop a course of study for the student that includes not only the courses they need to take to move towards graduation, but also courses that lead to their post-school goal. The course of study includes coordinated experiences in school and the community that enhance the student's learning and preparation for their post-secondary goals. Next, annual goals, and those are the ones that you're probably most familiar with, are written that connect back to those post-secondary goals and lead the student to achieving their goals. Finally, last step here is the identification, coordination, and planning for agency connections to support the student as they leave the school system. So let's start with transition assessments. These are called age-appropriate transition assessments. And let's look at those components here. We call it the SPIN, strengths, preferences, interests, and needs. Regardless of the level or the disability of the young adult student, all students must be included in the age-appropriate transition assessments as much as possible. We want to work to help students identify their strengths, their interests, their preferences, and their needs, which will begin to define the entire transition process. Transition assessment should identify the strengths that the student demonstrates in these areas, education and training, employment, and independent living. Sometimes we overlook strengths that may not be typical behaviors or skills that we value in a school environment, but they may be skills that are important in post-school environments. For example, a student that's doodling on their paper in an English class might be seen as an interruption in their work, but this might be an asset in an environment where out-of-the-box thinking and creative representation of ideas are encouraged. Preferences include work, education, training, and social environments where students are most productive. Many students have never thought about their, what their preferences are in a work or post-secondary education or training. Examples of preferences include things like, do you like to work inside or outside? Do you like to work with your hands? Do you like to work with words or numbers? Do you like to work in a slow-paced environment? or in a very noisy, quick-paced environment. I have an opinion that preferences are something that last your whole lifetime. Typically in third grade, if you like to work with people and be around people, you're probably gonna like that throughout your life. And if you like to be alone, that might also continue. The purpose of gathering interest areas for a student is to identify further experiences and transition services. When talking to their students about interests, it's important to help them determine which are interests in their future vocations or work and which are interests in their avocational or leisure activities. Identifying interest is based upon experiences. So if a student has very limited experiences in the community or exposure to employment, their identification of interest may be very unreliable or minimal. If they've only ever had a dog and played with their dog and liked their dog, they may say they want to be a vet, but once they explore some other things, that might not be true. Family, culture, ethnicity, and language also play an important role in helping students to identify their areas of interest. When determining the student's needs, we should consider the supports that the students will need in all areas of their life. Although school focuses on academics and social emotional needs, it's important that we consider the next environment that the student will be engaged in. Sometimes the support the student needs in school are very different from the supports they might need in a work or a post-secondary education environment. Regardless of that level of need or the type of disability of the young person, all students should be included in this assessment as much as possible. Assisting students to identify their strengths, interests, preference, and needs will define that whole planning process. So one other thing that I want to add to that is that families are really important in this because you bring a whole new set of information to that transition assessment. So be thinking about that. What do you see as strengths, preference, interests, and needs? 
So let's look at assessment best practices. Research tells us that the best practices in transition assessments are the most informative and reliable when they're provided by multiple people, including families and in multiple environments. Ideally, we should be using lots of different people, different sources of data that are based on naturally occurring experiences. This information needs to be understandable and the methods used should be sensitive to cultural diversity. You should be able to read that IEP and that transition assessments and really understand where it came from, if it's reliable, does it reflect your student and what you know about your student. So let's look at the flowchart again. So remember the, that flowchart, you're gonna see it a lot tonight. First step was age appropriate transition assessment. Are there any questions about the assessment? And this is Jay, I'll, let, I'll give folks a, a chance to think for a moment. I realized that um, we moved a slide at the very last minute and I didn't get to mention that a lot of content that Cinda is going over today, which is a lot. First, I just want to acknowledge that this is a lot of information that we are condensing down tonight. It is further expanded upon in our Writing Effective Transition Plans training course that we have. It's an asynchronous training course. And so Julia is going to be dropping links into the chat that align with these different modules. But know that this information is all available and can be looked at at your own pace, at your own time um, in, our, in, in our Canvas modules. And, um, and some of this goes into even deeper depth. So as you're thinking about this tonight, know that that's a resource you can come back to. And um, we'll have the link to the course at the end as well. Yeah, thank you, Jay. And for yes. me, if you just take away one thing about age-appropriate transition assessment, it's that it should include strengths, preference, interests, and needs. And you can dig into that Canvas course if, if you couldn't keep up with all that's that we shared with you. Sherilyn? Uh, thank you, Cinda. This is Sherilyn. Um, so uh, age-appropriate transition assessments, there are multiples depending where you are. Is that correct? Um, explain what you mean by multiples. Would there be a transition assessment at age 16, a trans and then an assessment at maybe 18 or once in this case, if you move into a transition program, um, you know, how yeah. the age appropriate, uh, let's see, what am I trying I got to the question. I think I got the question, Cheryl. Okay. Let me okay, so assessment, I'm gonna clarify here first. When we say uh, transition programs, some people, some parents actually think that transition's just for that 18 to 21. Transition services have to begin by the year the student turns 16, earlier when appropriate. So when that happens that first year, 15 and a half, moving into that IEP for 16, there needs to be a transition assessment. And it's not, it's not a test that you can just grab. It's not something you give to the student every year, but the district figures out and the teacher figures out, how do we gather interests? How do we gather preferences, needs, and strengths? And it may be, that that's an interview with the student, an interview with the parents. It might be observation. It might be a survey. It might be a, a try something out and gather information about how it worked. But it has to be rigorous and it has to gather all this information and not just a one-time interview. And each year, it has to be updated. Now, the present level performance in the IEP, which we also do assessment every year, that can be included in this. So if there's, there's reading assessment every year, in the transition assessment, the teacher might write that reading is a strength for the student. And this will be really um, a strength as they go on to post-secondary education, or, or maybe not, it might be a need. So it all ties together, but these four components have to be addressed every single year, as long as they have an IEP. Uh, this is Cheryl Lynn. Thank you. And I think part of my, I'll be frank, it's been a long day, so I don't have a lot of filters. Uh, I think part of my uh, confusion is uh, I've really not seen this and I have a 12th grader. And some districts have that transition assessment piece buried in the present level of performance, but I know that Seattle Public Schools has a form for the transition plan. 
And in that, there is this transition assessment. So my advice to parents, you start with this. This is step number one, is before the IEP meeting, I'd like to look over that age-appropriate transition assessment. I'd like to come prepared to add to that. I'd like to strengthen that. I'd like my student to know about that. So um, this is a good, good question. I hope this answers some of the questions that have come up from other parents. So should we move on to the next section? This is the, that's a big section. As you know, in special ed, assessment drives everything. So we'll keep going. And I just saw a question coming to the chat that I think if I, um, the question is, can a student do transition as well as try to complete the high school diploma? Absolutely. And by transition, I'm having, I'm thinking that that question might mean transition program. So students are in high school and they're, have, they have a trend, if they have an IEP, they have a transition plan all through high school. They're also working towards completing high school and graduation. Some students might finish the diploma and then go on to transition, uh, transition 18 to 21 program. Some districts do that, some don't. So, you know, that's a, a discussion that needs to happen, particularly when we get to the course of study and the high school and beyond plan. How does that student travel through the high school? I know a lot of you are parents of 18 year olds here tonight and you're like, well, this is too late. What are we gonna do? So um, this, this should still be in the IEP. And if the student's staying for two or three more years or four more years or six more years, this transition plan is updated each year and moving towards completion of the high school graduation requirements. Cinda, one more question for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had said something about it, like it could be an interview, it could be a survey. And then there was a third thing you mentioned. What was that third thing again? Someone it could said. be observation. Observation. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me give a quick little example. Kid says, I want to be a snowboarder, um, a snowboard instructor. Okay. So survey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Snowboard instructor. Parents. What's the student want to be when they grow up? Snowboard instructor. So then you say, hmm, has anyone ever observed this student on a snowboard? No, he's never or she's never or they've never been out on a snowboard. So now we've got an observation that says, uh-uh, they just have, they have a board, but they've never used it. So it's gathering all this information. And then you're going, well, if you've got time and you want to take lessons and you want to really move towards this goal, then that would be part of your transition plan. This is outside of school, of course. But if the student says, no, I don't like to be cold, there's a preference. So now we're going to pull back from that and help with other information and gathering and experiences. So I know that's kind of a funny, a funny example, but it's all of it. It's not just what the student says, but it's what do they do? What do they, what do you see that they like? What does the family see that they like? And where are their skills? Great. I think um, we can move on. I am going to put um, Julia on the spot and ask her to grab a link to put in the chat though. I see there's a question for someone who's looking about examples of assessments. And on the CCTS website under our resources page, we have a section on assessments. So Julia, if you don't mind when you get a chance, if you could grab that and drop that in the chat, that would be super helpful. Yeah. And you know, I could do an entire day just on this section. So you're getting you're getting the uh, Reader's Digest version, version here. So know that there's lots more on our website. So let's move on to post-secondary goals. So now that you have all this information gathered and a, for a student that is 15 or 16 years old, these post-secondary goals might not be very reliable. But as the student gets older, we want them to be more reliable. So there's two types of goals in the IEP plan. There is the post-secondary or post-school goals and there's the annual goals. Post-secondary goals are built on those students' strengths, preferences, interests, and needs and they incorporate the cultural values of the family and those of the student. They must be measurable as they are objectives for the student when they leave high school. But let me just say before we go, it's not guaranteed. They're not guaranteed. So they're, they have to be reliable and gathered from 
that a transition assessment. But if the student says, I want to work in, word, root, um, in the medical field, I want to be a, uh, an OT, and that's what's written on the IEP, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. But we have to help the student try to get to that and help them decide if that's going to work or not and the skills to get there. So let's move into those post-secondary goals. These are the goals the student will achieve after they leave high school. They must address those areas identified in the transition plan in education and training, employment, and if appropriate, independent living skills. So examples for education and training are identifying where the student will learn and the focus of their education or training. So that post-secondary goal in education, we have examples on our website as well, but it might be the student will attend a two-year program in culinary arts. That's a post-secondary goal in education. Or the student might do an on-the-job training program in hospitality, and it gets tighter as they get older. Um, examples for employment goals include what the student will do for work after leaving the high school and what that might look like. It might not be the first year out of high school. It might be three or four years out of high school, but it may say the student will work in hospitality in uh, hotels. That might be their post-secondary goal in employment. And if the IEP team determines that independent living is needed, this might include where the student will live after high school and what they can do to live as independently as possible. So it might include transportation goals, for instance. So let's move to the next slide. Back to that flow chart. We've gathered the information. When you get that IEP, look for that post-secondary goal in post-secondary education or training. And it can be on the job training. It can be a four-year college, anything in between. And then look for that goal in employment and then independent living. So questions about post-secondary goals before we go on to transition services. Yeah, Cindy, we had a question come through asking if a transition plan can include taking an extra year to finish a regular diploma. I don't know that it would be the transition plan necessarily, but it would be part of that course of study. So again, very individualized question for this particular student, but what you would do is look at how many years does it take to finish high school? What's the course of study look like? And if it's gonna be five years, then plotting out those five years along with the high school and beyond plan, which we'll talk about later. So I guess the answer is yes, but if this, if depending upon that individual case, it may be that there's something I don't know, so the answer might be no, but I would guess it's probably a yes. How do you like that? Around in a circle. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to uh, identifying transition services. This is this is Cheryl Lynn again. I, yeah. I will just ask the when you talked about the um, the post secondary, but the age uh, it, as they get closer and they're doing more. I can see those in like in what is in Seattle, the Bridges program for students who are in that role. What would it be like for um, somebody who is going to be able to going more likely college bound, perhaps? I mean, or at, at an mm -hmm. academic college level, um, like I'm thinking of someone who's in um, uh, taking a college and high school classes or in running start. Uh, is that yeah absolutely and we have we have examples for students whose post-secondary goal are for your college for a short-term training program for straight to employment and on the job training but let me just say one thing you should never see the post-secondary goal as bridges because bridges is still special education public education, IEP. It's for the year after the student leaves the school system. So sometimes we, we get this, you know, it's like, oh, my student, my child has graduated from high school. They're in the Bridges program or they're in a, an 18 to 21 program. They're not in the high school setting, but they're still in the school district. They're not post-school yet. 
So for that student, it might be that um, they're going to do move into an on the job training program with a job coach and they're interested in a certain area for a student that has a post secondary goal as a four year college. They would they may in, in their early freshman year not quite know what they want to do, but they know they want to go to college. They know they want to work with people. They know they don't want to do anything with medicine. But each year in that transition plan, we get a little clearer about what they do want to do. And, and I don't know, put Julie on the spot again, but there are examples of each of these um, post-secondary goals. There's some really great student examples in our, in our Canvas course and on our website. This is okay. Cheryl. Thank you, Cinda. And I'll um I'll also let, we'll we'll start pulling some of the Q and A from our Padlet. So I, and uh, I didn't mean to step on you. Go ahead, Jill. Uh yeah. Um, one question from the Padlet that came in is, who writes the transition plan? The district, the parent. Whose responsibility is it? The same person typically that writes the IEP. Um, so it would it would be the case manager, the special ed teacher with information from everyone, including the student, the parents. It's just like writing an IEP. It's a legal document. It's written by the case manager and it is part of the the IEP. Um, I hope I don't get myself in trouble here, but I was doing a training for Seattle School a High School one time and what happened was I was doing all this stuff on transition assessment and they said, well, we don't write the transition plan. We just write the IEP. And the person who writes a transition plan doesn't know the student. So how are they supposed to do this? I think that has changed, but the person that writes the transition plan needs to know the student and work with, if there's two people writing this, which I personally don't think there should be. It should be the person that manages and knows the student and the family. But if there are two people, they have to be working together and the student has to be involved. You cannot write transition assessment data unless you know the student. And that I'm not backing down from. So that won't get me in trouble. Okay. Shall we go on to the next step, which is transition services? Yeah, and, and this is Jay. We will have some examples of some of those, some more post-secondary goals as we look at these transition services as yeah. well. Yeah, we'll get into some. So transition services are defined by the Washington Administrative Code, lovingly called the WAC. Once the IEP team has the assessment data documented and they figured out what those measurable post-secondary goals are, then the team must decide what are the transition services? What is the coordinated set of activities that will support the student in reaching their post-secondary goals? Services are designed to be result-oriented, meaning they lead to those post-secondary goals and they facilitate the movement from school to post-school living environments. Transition services are based on the students guess what? Needs, strengths, preferences, and interests. So you can see how the transition assessments are really important to the development of the whole transition plan. So let's look at the next slide. Transition services can consist of the following, but it's not required that each of these services are included in a student's transition plan and their I, in their IEP. So when it says they need to be determined if they should be included. It doesn't mean they have to be there, but the IEP team should be looking at this. So the first one is instruction. And this can be part of that specially designed services. For instance, a student who needs specially designed instruction in reading based upon their assessments will also need to increase their reading skills for post-secondary goals in education, training, or employment. So if there is a reading goal in the IEP, that is also a transition service. So see how it fits together because we want to help students increase their reading skills for post-school settings. Related services are defined as transportation or other needed developmental, corrective, or supportive services, or it could also include assistive technology. So again, thinking about where the student wants to be after high school, 
Do they need assistive technology to get to meet that post-secondary goal? Or do they need help with transportation? So that's determined by that IEP team. Community experiences may not be needed by all students, but it is designed to support those post-secondary goals based on that assessment. And the IEP team determines whether that's needed. So some examples of community-based experiences might be exploration, job training, banking, shopping, transportation, counseling, recreational activities. All of these might be part of that post-secondary adult living objectives and uh, adult living objectives with employment. So employment skills might be part of those services or it might not be. Shall we move on to the next slide, please? This means that transition services are going to support the accomplishment of that post-secondary goal. And as we said, this may include specially designed instruction. That's the special ed part of the IEP. Typically, we think of that as math, reading, writing. It might include that. And questions to ask when determining whether transition services are needed in all these areas is what experiences must the student participate during that academic year that are necessary to achieve their post-secondary goals? What services are essential for the student to develop their skills and knowledge to achieve that post-secondary goal? And do we know enough about the student's vocational skills to identify appropriate post-secondary employment goals or to design activities so, to support those goals? So those are the types of questions that we would ask at that IEP meeting to determine what services are needed. So some sample examples, let's look at an example of transition services for Amrita. So remember that transition services are designed to, be to lead that student and help them reach their post-secondary goal. Amrita's goal is to attend Washington Institute of Technology and to earn her computer security and network technology degree. Her transition services include meeting with the Disability Student Services Coordinator at the Washington Institute of Technology so that she knows what documentation she needs for her accommodation plan when she goes to school there. She also will meet with her high school counselor to develop a list, a checklist for applying to the program. The special education teacher or case manager will assist her in doing this as needed. So let's continue with Amrita's example. Her goal for employment after high school is to be employed in the computer security industry. Transition services include researching and identifying the business that employ computer security professionals. She'll interview people working in the industry. She'll identify specific skills needed, and she'll review the accommodations provided to employees. And, and one note on this, this could happen as part of a class. This could be part of her high school and beyond program. This could also be homework, but things that she does on her own that she can explore and then come back and, and talk about with her teacher or write something up. So there's various ways that this could be accomplished. And then let's look at the last one for Amrita. Her post-secondary, they, they determined that she does have a post-secondary goal in independent living. And that goal is that she will join and participate in a technology networking group in her community. Transition services include gathering information on the Washington Technology Student Association and on local technology networking groups to see if these are of interest. We have examples like this for students with various disabilities. So here are some further examples. Notice that some are instruction activities where others are experiential activities. Enrolling in an SAT prep or other program. Instruction and practice in self-advocacy skills. Instruction and practice in interviewing skills. Instruction and practice in independent living skills, such as grooming, meal prep, transportation, other 
These go hand in hand with relating to and preparing students to be successful in their post-secondary goals. And this is certainly an area where parents can express their concerns and areas that they think that a student might need help based on their post-secondary goal. So let's look at that flow chart. We're getting there. Uh, the, we're down to identify transition services. Do you have any questions about this before we go to course of study? I will take it back to Elaine or to Cheryl Lynn. I think if we, Elaine, you, you're looking in the Padlet too in terms of putting some of these elements. I am, yeah, I'm trying to handle the chat and the Padlet. There's some things in the chat that are very um, student specific and individualized. So that's why I'm not responding to them for those that you have questions. Um, because I'm not a special ed expert. So we're putting in links and handling what we can, and then we'll capture the chat um, just so we can um, fill in Cinda and Jay on what's going on. So at this time, I think you're good to move forward, Cinda. Okay. I, I, I want, I'm sorry, I want to just do one check, um, maybe whether people want to do a show of hands. Again, it's been a long day. I am, I am feeling a little overwhelmed by all this information. <laughs> and I'm supposed to have been through all this. And I think it, it's, uh, yeah, is that, am I, am I not alone? <laughs> um, I, it's kind of coming at me and I'm like, have I heard this before? Again, I have a 12th grader and I just feel like I, I was like, does nobody do this in Seattle? Has that been the experience that I've been having? And um, I, I, I'm kind of taken aback. It, I, it kind of makes sense in terms of like walking through these parts. And yet I'm like, well, why is this brand new to me? So, um, again, this is my experience, but I, I, I'm going to guess I'm, I'm channeling a little bit of some of our audience. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me pull it back a little bit, Sherilyn. So yeah, good job. Good job. This, this is a ton of information, but I hope that what you'll take from this, and we can, I can, I can really make it the fuck up. simpler. Hang on one second. But what, what I would hope that you would take is this flow chart, your, your child's IEP, find the transition plan and say, where is the transition assessment? Where is it? And see if you can find it. Where, because there's, there should be a form that lists each one of these in the IEP. And if it's not there, then we can we can also, um, I don't know if anybody can find this quickly, but we can send it to you, Sherilyn. But the transition state form is available on, our, on OSPI's website for the transition plan. School districts don't have to use that form. And I, and I know that Seattle does not, um, but every component, that's on the state form has to be in every district's form somewhere. And it should be in the, in the plan. And I think you, what do you, what's the IEP, um, is IEP online? Is that what you are using? This is Yana, I'm sorry. I just wanna ask if somebody could please remove uh, someone who's just posting yes. things in the- I just took care of that, I apologize. Thank you. So, so look at the form, look at the IEP and make sure all these pieces are there and then take away under transition assessment, there should be these four things, interests, preferences, or, well, I'm sorry, strengths, preferences, interests, needs. And then there should be post-school goals. And I tell general ed teachers, if nothing else, go see what that post-secondary goal is. Because if this, if it says the student is interested in um, automotive repair, that's going to give you an in with that student. You're going to know something and talk to him about it. And the student says, I'm not interested in automotive repair. <laughs> then were you ever, or does this IEP need to be updated next year? And then start looking for what services are, are what are they doing to help the student get there? And some of this may be happening in general ed, hopefully, but it's captured in, I, in the IEP. 
So the course of study, let me take you through that. I hope people's eyes don't roll. I'll try to make this well, a little simple. I was just wondering if we could pause for like, and do like five minutes of questions or something so okay. that we can kind of yeah. all Absolutely. catch up to where you are. Um, because there are some more questions in the Padlet that might help people. Um, so um, there's a couple um, that are about, so is the, um, is progress monitoring and data collection required for these like it is for the IEP? That's one question. Um, and then similarly, is it a legal document like the IEP? And I guess you're saying it's in the IEP. It is a legal document. It is okay. definitely a legal document. It is part of the IEP. It's not separate of, from the IEP. And it must be part of the IEP by the year, by that year, the student turns 16. So if they turn 16, in August and their IEP is, you know, the very next IEP, it should have happened prior. So if their IEP was in June and they're gonna turn 16 in August, it should have been in that IEP when they were 15. See what I'm and saying? You get so progress it has to be on it. It, it. And the progress monitoring does not happen as it does with annual goals. So, but every year it, there's, informal progress monitoring, right? Is it the transition assessment? Do we, how do we update it? Has interest changed? Have strengths changed? There should have been things going on so that the student is moving towards their post-secondary goal. So every part of the transition plan is updated every year when the, when the annual IEP is due. Informal progress monitoring. Yeah, I would say annual, you know, annual updates, annual revisions, annual, you know, you should not see a transition plan every year that says the exact same thing under transition assessment. Student wants to be a dog walker. Student wants to be a dog walker. That's not okay. It has to have all of this, these things in it. And hopefully the student tried out some things and says, yes, I really am interested in this, or no, I found out I don't like this. So it's updated annually. And that happens in the IEP meeting? Yeah, well, it just like everything else, it should be, you can't go into the IEP and do a transition assessment. It should be ongoing, you know, so you're gathering information and it should be, um, it can be really vague when you're a 15 year old. Like I wanna work with people, I don't know what that means. But by the time that they're in their last few years of high school, it's it should be a lot more specific for the post-secondary goals. I, uh, this is Cheryl Lynn, I, um, I'm following it and I really realize I, good to hear about the the dog walker or the kind of the simple at fifteen. Um, I'm really feeling like I'm not. Uh, this is not something I've experienced, um, and I have and I haven't really heard that from my you know uh, age peer age uh, parent support, if you will. Uh, so I think I'm confused in large part or kind of feeling overwhelmed because what you're saying needs to be happening is not happening, um, which is why it's good to have this discussion. Uh, Christy has a great question about, uh, I'm gonna see if I can find the transition plan in my son's IEP to potentially pull up. Um, and then I, I, I'll, Christy, I'll hand it back to you if you wanna take a few more of these questions so we can kind of go through them while I'm working on that. Yeah, so um, I just was looking at a good one. Can I, can I just put one little thing in here? Mm -hmm. What I suggest you all do is before you go into that IEP meeting next time, or even now, say, I want to start with the transition plan. I want us to talk about the transition plan that's in the IEP. I want us to talk about all of these things on the flow chart, and then let's move to the annual goals and all that other stuff. And if there's nothing there, then I would say, where's the transition plan and can we develop that before going forward with what they may be seen as the IEP even though this is part of the IEP and please go ahead Christy um sorry I think I I think I lost it 
Um, does anyone, if anybody wants to um, to ask aloud, that's good too. I guess I have one. Meanwhile, is um, so I might have often I miss the very beginning because I'm like setting things up and stuff. But so you guys, this is a this is a training program that you guys have that you or a model that you have that you give out to the schools and they instituted or how do you guys relate to what the schools are doing? So we are um, funded by OSPI and our job okay. is, is to develop, provide training around everything to do with transition services. We also do the follow-up study with students one year after they leave high school. If you've seen that, we're gonna share that at the end of this. So we have online trainings. We've, um, I've done training in Seattle schools before <laughs> a number of times over the years. Um, I think that every, well, I mean, every school district has to do transition planning for students age 16 and older. And there are parent complaints. There are places to go at OSPI. Um, this has to be here on the IEP. There's an actual checklist that is used for that IEP. So we're not monitors, we're not compliance officers, but we provide the information to help write compliant IEPs with the goal of helping students reach their post-school goals. So that's our job. Um, I've, I'm also faculty in special education and taught special ed teachers. And honestly, I have students come back to me now that are out there in the field that say, I'm the only one in the school that knows about transition at the high school. A lot of universities don't provide the training around secondary special ed transition unless there's faculty that are really invested in it. So sometimes parents are the ones that push and make right. something happen. And it I think it's a, a general issue with special education is that it relies on parents to notice that something isn't happening or is missing. And that requires parents to have the education to know that something's missing. And for something that doesn't happen until the end, you know, by the time they learn about it, it might be too late. Yeah, um, it, it shouldn't be so. your responsibility. You should be partnering. Um, you, you know, you should be getting this information. Take this flow chart, blow it up, and send it to your teacher and say, I want you to go through every one of these with me. Well, that, oh, sorry, I just want to jump in. Yeah, Sherilyn, let's get your question. And I want to make sure we have time to get through the rest of the presentation. We're I, I totally about, understand. Um, Hi, this an is Sherilyn, and, and, I, and I do understand that. And I'm just going to go ahead and I will, um, I'm going to just take over the screen sharing for a bit. Uh, I did do, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm violating my son's privacy too much. Um, so I did find the age appropriate. Is everybody seeing that screen? Yeah. Okay. So here is in an IEP, an age appropriate transition assessment. There's our needs, our strengths, and our preferences. Um, uh, is this, how would I say, is this a um, robust, is You've this a full course me. meal? Or, so, Sherilyn, I'm, I'm going to um, decline to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> because of all kinds of reasons. Um, Got it. But, you know, one thing that when we get to the end, um, there's a checklist. And the other thing I just want to say is we go through these next components of the IEP. I'm not I'm going to make them shorter. We're just I, you're, we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want you to know what steps are there and know that you're on overload right now. So we'll go back to course of study and then we'll take more questions at the end. So let's just look at these and I'm going to, I'm going to shorten them up a little. So once all this stuff is done, now we have to look at the course of study. And again, IDEA says you got to have this, you got to have this in the IEP, but it doesn't tell you how it should look other than it, it, can't just be a list of courses. So this is that question that came up about, can they stay an extra year? You know, could it be four years? Could it be three years? The course of study doesn't tell you that, but it does 
tell you to write in the IEP to clearly identify what courses, experiences, and activities the student needs to do that year, or some districts do two or three years, or some do clear through the end. And again, we've got examples of this on our website. So the course of study is more than just a list. It's got all these you know, experiences and activities. And on the website, we have Felicia, Javier, and Hasmin, and it one's one year, one's two year. And for Hasmin, it is also includes independent living goals. She has more significant disabilities. So you can take a look at these course of study and again, look for it on the IEP. So questions about course of study. This is the easiest one. Let's, let's get through the next two and then we'll stop for questions. I think you're probably all familiar with the annual goals, but Jay, I'm gonna have you just go back one slide to that flow chart again. Here's the big surprise to teachers. What are annual goals doing down at the bottom of the flow chart? Teachers, are, their, their minds are boggled because they said, oh, if you've got this transition plan in place, now we can write annual goals to support that transition plan in reading, in math, in behavior, in communication skills. So go ahead, Jay, to the next. So the annual goals really should come later and they're driven by that post-secondary post goal and by all that is good assessment. So post, we've been talking about post-secondary goals, annual goals are the one-year goal, Post-secondary goals are revisited every year, but they might not change. So let's look at the difference between the two. Who identifies the post-secondary goal? Student and IEP team. Annual goal, student and IEP team. Family input, of course. The post-secondary goal is for after high school. The annual goal is while in high school. And then as we said, with post-secondary goals, you'll see education training, employment, independent living when needed. Annual goals are identified through that present level of performance. It's that assessment that looks at reading, looks at communication skills, looks at math skills. And then that though can be linked to the transition plan to help build those skills for where they wanna be after high school. How is it measured? Transition services and progress data. So next slide, moving on, annual goals. I'm sure there's a ton of questions about that, but we're gonna hold until we get through this last section because I think this would be um, interesting to parents. So agency connections. Through partnerships with adult agencies, school districts can create opportunities for their students and for parents with the resources and opportunities to connect them while they're in school for after they leave school. So next slide, please. We have to start early. And the reason is that the K-12 or the K-21 system is entitlement. The public school system has to provide services to your child. And if they qualify for special ed, they get services. But once they leave high school, once they leave the Bridges program, once they graduate, once they drop out, once they're no longer counted as a student, it's no more entitlement. You have to be eligible and you have to have documentation to prove it. And agencies are funny. They can hold off because of budget constraints. People can leave, they can take a long time uh, to find someone eligible, so you have to start early. Students should be involved, no matter what the disability. If this, even if the student is nonverbal, they should be involved in this process. And it's a great way for them to practice their self-advocacy skills. Here are just a few of the resources. Um, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, which Many of you may know they're starting some services early with, with what's called pre-employment transition services, um, developmental disabilities administration and social security administration are just a few, but there's lots more that include things like housing, 
uh, medical care, mental health care, all of those things that we need to help students identify what they'll need after high school. Okay, let's stop for questions for a minute. Oh yeah, let's do this slide. Um, parents, if an agency is written into the IEP, they have to be invited to the IEP meeting in order to say that they will give those services and before they can be invited, you or your adult child must give permission for them to come. And so that, that has to happen. Uh, agency personnel should be invited three to four weeks in advance, but if they come, there should be a purpose for them being there. Why are they coming? They should be part of the conversation and they should know why they're there. Let's go to the next slide, please. So questions about any of this flow chart before we move into something else, the high school and beyond plan. Maybe you don't care about that at this point. Maybe this has boggled your mind so much that you're like, let's stop here um, and we can show you some resources, but let's just take a, a feel of the audience. I see Caleb there. Hi, Caleb. How's the questions looking, Christy? Yeah, I'm also going to say if anybody wants to raise their hand um, and just give a little bit of feedback, I, I, I'm seeing it a little bit more. I'm also a little bit disappointed. Um, Cheryl, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of confused with the whole agency part. So is it just those three listed that could come no. to an IEP meeting? I'm confused. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for, for helping me help myself clarify this for you. Those are just the big ones. Um, there's lots and lots of agencies out there, but I think that any student who has an IEP while in high school should be familiar with and be connected at least to know about Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And so they have a website they have a link that tells you who their liaison is for every high school. Um, that is, we can stick that in there someplace, I believe. And so finding that out, asking the special ed teacher, who is the DVR person? Because they're the ones you're going to want to connect with before your, your student leaves high school. They provide services if the student is eligible for employment. Now, all roads lead to employment, right? So training for employment may be a possibility. It's not an entitlement. It's not a guarantee, but you should start building that relationship. And Would if, an agency be like a school, like a college, a community college, or is that a whole different thing? You know, the, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation is a state agency like public schools, like a right. state agency, and then they have regional directors, and then they have vocational counselors, and they have transition experts um, across the state. So finding out who that is, and a, a great, um, I think, opportunity for parents is invite someone in from DBR. I'll, I'll throw out a name for you, Cheryl Lynn, Abby Smith um, from Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We can give you her her uh, contact information. She's the state person for the free employment transition at DVR. And she might be willing to come in and explain to everybody who is, who's DVR, what do we do? Um, if your child qualifies for DDA, they probably, you will probably already have a connection for them. But you know, there's agencies, there's mental health agencies, there's um, employment agencies, these are the kinds of agencies that if you need help with housing, if you need help with uh, finding a job and you're no longer in high school, these are places to go and see what you can find. I hate to say this, but we have a web page at CCTS. Some of it's a little out of, out of um, I think we still have it on there, don't we, Jay? That might at least give Cheryl an idea of what we're talking about with agencies, our agency linkages page. Yeah. Okay. And I kind of see a list. Yeah. 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 We haven't updated it, but it gives you a general idea of what we're talking about. And that might help you, Cheryl. Okay. Thank you. 
Are there other questions people want to bring up or other ways we can keep going through the Padlet? Um, okay, so um, here's a question. Can you talk about independent living for students who are academically able to attend college classes but can't otherwise survive outside the home? I, I would go back to a good transition assessment. <laughs> what are their strengths for post-secondary education? Um, what are their needs? And let's say they have extreme anxiety and they don't want to leave home. And then we might start investigating four-year college programs that they can do from home. Or, you know, it's, it's very individualized. So um, it, would, it would be dependent, or if they have healthcare needs, or if there's physical disabilities. So whatever that assessment identifies, like, What's their post-secondary goal? They have the strengths or they have the academics to go on to post-secondary for your college, but what are their needs? And then addressing those needs. And those assessments you said are done when they're a junior or? or they're through? done. They, they're, they, you start gathering that information at the age of 15. So they're okay. ready to go at 16 and then every year after. So for that particular student, I would I would want to do an assessment to find out what's in the way of them meeting their post school goals if they want to go to college. What what's the problem? And not getting into individual cases here, but in general, trying to figure that out. And it might be. I mean, I I had a student that couldn't go to the college they wanted to because there was way too much snow and they used a wheelchair and said that's not going to work for me. So that was part of the assessment is finding a place for that student to go that they felt like they could be outside and they were more independent and didn't have to count on all the things to happen to get roads opened up and stairs cleared off and elevators cleared off. And so, you know, that's that's an example of looking at what's what's the barriers. This is Cheryl Lynn. Um, Yana, you want to ask your question and then we've got uh, uh, two more well, actually, Christy, then I'll leave it to you in terms of going through the the um, chat and the Padlet. So, Yana? Yeah, hi. So um, I wonder what you would say um, about, you know, students who are almost 18, has, have not been assessed for secondary transition or have been and still don't have the transition plan or they don't ha even have high school and beyond plan. And as they are highly capable, they are being told they should stay past uh, seeing their senior year. What would your answer to that team be or to those teams? Because this is, that's not just one team, it's a lot more teams. So I would really be curious about that. That's a that's a hard question to answer without the specifics, and, and I can't do the specifics, but what I would say is bring a team together, sit down, and start going through all of this. Start with the assessments, and, and maybe, you know, they're everywhere, but like look at that flow chart and start plugging things in of where, where is that, what's gathered, what, what's identified as a post-secondary goal, what's the course of study look like, and if there's if there's a lot missing and that's, you know, you, first of all, you give that teacher the chance to remedy that, but then I would also ask someone from the, the administration team to come and help with that, um, figure it all out because it needs to be there. But again, maybe it is, you know, I know I've been in, in a lot of meetings where all the pieces are there, but nobody's ever put it all together. So, and I guess this relates to a question um, that was asked, what if the plan isn't followed or implemented? Does the typical path for seeking accountability apply, for example, community complaints? Yes, yeah, the, the transition plan is the IEP. I mean, it's part of the IEP. So if you would do exactly the same process, the same steps, if you got an IEP and your student needed transitions or not transition services, but academic services in reading, for instance, and there's no assessment 
or the assessment is very full of holes and it doesn't make sense and there's no goals or there's annual goals but there's no services you would follow the same process it is part of the IEP and I posted the um, information for the parent liaison at OSPI that helps deal with complaints um, for school districts in the Padlet and also in the chat. Um, so you all can have that resource. Shall we try to get through the high school and beyond plan before we run out of time here? It's only two slides, I think. <laughs> This is Sherilyn. Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, because I do want to get to the resources at the end. So finally, we want to share some information with you about the high school and beyond plan and how it aligns with the IEP transition plan. This is new to a lot of parents and families, and there's even a few teachers who aren't really sure about how all this works together. So the transition plan is part of the IEP. It's a federal mandate. The high school and beyond plan, lovingly called the HISB, is a state requirement. And for students who receive special ed services, both an IEP transition plan and a high school and beyond plan must be in place. So in Washington state, all students have a high school and beyond plan as part of their graduation requirements. And again, on our website and in a Canvas course, we have information about that. So examples and all kinds of stuff you can look at. Um, the High School and Beyond Plan helps students identify their career goals, set post-school goals, plan their courses, define a graduation pathway, and develop a resume or an activity log. This is very general. I, I see Caleb in the audience who knows all the ins and outs of this, but we're not getting there tonight, Caleb. So um, comparing the IEP and the high school and beyond plan, there are many components to both of these. A lot of the tasks are similar, but the documents are different. There needs to be two. Both of them have components that include student assessment. You've heard enough about transition assessments tonight for the IEP. The high school and beyond plan also has that, but it is a career interest inventory. So it's just that it can just be a career interest inventory. Some schools do more than that, but the IEP typically has a lot more information, which the high school and beyond plan might want to look at that and pull that into their plan so that it all, all lines together. Um, there are very, post -sec very specific post-secondary and annual goals in the IEP and the high school and beyond plan requires career and educational goals. There's a course of study in the IEP and the high school and beyond plan requires an academic course planner and a graduation pathway. At the end of that last year in high school, and we didn't go into this tonight, but there is a summary of academic achievement and functional performance for the IEP and you're probably all saying we've never even heard of that, but that's a summary at the end of the IEP that last year. And the high school and beyond plan requires a resume or an activity log documenting the students work towards their career and educational goals. And that summary for the IEP and that high school and beyond plan resume or activity log again should align. So you can see that these, these are similar but different. And they both both make use of information that can be shared. And it should help develop a rigorous plan for the student and help them reach those post-school goals. So more information on our website, more information at Seattle Public Schools. Each school district defines this a little differently. So this is pretty broad. So next slide. We're going to move to resources. So this is a lot of information. And I talked to you a little bit about how all those components of the IEP must be there. So OSPI has to actually report a sampling of these to the feds and it's called B13. And they use this indicator B13 checklist or a transition file review, which is what we've used to develop all of our training. So you can click on that and you can look at that form to see if the IEP that you have for your student matches that. 
And then we have a link right to the very special transition services flowchart, which you can click and download. We know some teachers that keep it handy so that they can refer to it. And then we talked about the post-school outcome data. And this is for every student with an IEP that graduated or dropped out of high school, school districts, every school district in the state that has a high school calls them up one year later and uses our survey to see what they're doing. And you can look at this post-school outcome data for Seattle schools and for your ESD. So, phew, a lot of, lot of information coming at you. Um, a lot of you feeling like, man, I didn't know this. This is too much. Um, I'm going to hand this back to Jay just to give you some last little bits of information, and then we'll see if there's any last questions and where do we go from here. Thank you so much, Zenda. Um, that was a lot. I always learn new things from you. I've been working at CCTS for seven years now, and I'm I'm always learning. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, reiterate I know um it's at CCTS it's we're kind of a, an interesting organization what do we do what do we provide we don't provide those direct services to students and families um but we have some links on this slide for some organizations who do provide those direct services um I'll, I'll just point out a couple of these the Washington Initiative for Supportive Employment or WISE they're a great resource it's Important to know that they are different from wraparound with intensive services, with is, which is wise with a lowercase e at the end, and that's geared towards mental health care and typically requires a referral. And then um, that last link, the family engagement and guidance page on the OSPA website includes the resources for more information about how and when to use those formal dispute options and navigate other procedure, procedural safeguards. So just wanted to highlight those for you. And this was that slide that we moved to the very end. Um, these are some resources that you might be interested in coming back to. You've heard this tonight. Again, this is a very condensed training. We've done this training over the course of two days for teachers. So you have taken in so much information in a very short amount of time. The Writing Effective Transition Plans Canvas course that we have and that we're linking to addresses everything you've heard tonight. Um, not some of the extra special nuggets that Cinda shared with you. That's you get you got that for for being here. But a lot of that content can be referred back to and can be shared easily. We also have some additional content on developing student led IEP meetings, developing job shadow experiences, and then partnerships for inclusion that focuses on developing relationships between special educators and career technical education. And so. With that, I'm going to put up our contact information. If you have questions about the content that we've shared tonight or where you can find some more of these resources that we've been, I know Elaine and Julia, big shout out. I know they've been dropping resources in the chat on the fly. Thank you so much. Um, please feel free to email our team at cctsu.edu. at seattleu.edu. We are always looking at that inbox and making sure that information gets routed to the right place. And then again, our site is seattleu.edu slash ccts. You can subscribe to our newsletters. We send those out quarterly um, and stay connected with us. So with that, um, I will stop sharing my screen and we have about um, 10 minutes left before we've got we've to go tonight. I'm going to give you a, a, something to think about. Um, you might want to take, think about taking that Canvas course, Writing Effective Transition Plans, which takes each of these chunks and break them down and maybe you have a community of practice or a, or a work group or a support group that says, okay, for this month, we're just gonna all, like a, it's almost like a book club, right? We're gonna dig into transition assessments. We're gonna read about it. We're gonna share each other's, you know, our IEPs and what we've learned and what we're doing and just take a month and do transition assessment. And then the next month do the next piece or somehow break this down so that you can, support each other or ask ask some teachers to join you. I mean, teachers oftentimes actually look for time to learn this. They're they're so busy that they think they know it, but they sometimes don't. And it's it helps to break it off in little bites. This is Cheryl Lynn. Thank you. Um, I think that idea of kind of trying to break it into smaller pieces, it, it also does bring up the um, the <laughs> The constant challenge that when you become a parent of a kid with an IEP, there is a workload you assume that you don't realize you've been assigned. Yeah. 
And so in our, you know, I mentioned off the top of this meeting, our guide, you know, getting results in Seattle Public Schools, our guide to special education, um, which as we put together does not have anything about transition because we kind of at some point were like, okay, we got to, we got to call this done for now. And it can, it's, um, it's a lot to comprehend, um, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. when it hasn't been modeled. I mean, I, I think the reason that I'm, I really thought I was a little bit more on top of this. I've been going to resource fairs and I, I'm not going to talk for a long time because I do want other people. I would love others here to just share some feedback. And if you got this and this is really helpful, I'd love to hear it because that helps me learn better or overall. And I, I just want to acknowledge to all your parents, you know, I, I went through a time when my child had a very significant disability and I thought it was real easy to teach about it until I had to live it. And it just about took us all down. And what we learned from this was you got to find time for you, you know, and we hear you. We know how tough this is when you can't find two seconds for yourself. So we hope that our information helps you, but doesn't overwhelm you. So if there's ways we can help chunk it off, you know, we'll do it. So let's open it up for questions, comments, um, what, whatever you need in the last, what we have about seven minutes. <laughs> Hey, Sandra. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Jana had a positive experience to share or a goodish experience. So I thought it would be nice to hear from her um, since we all know this can be a frustrating process to hear something positive that's come from it. So I already asked my question and I see Pam's hand is up. So if Pam could take her turn before me, that would be better. And before you go, I just wanted to say um, thank you guys so much for sharing the slides um, so that all those links and we'll reshow the slides and we'll have the and for letting us record so people can go back and watch and we'll have those up on our website. So I just want before people start dropping off, I just wanted to say that and thank you for being here. Thank you. So this is Pam and it's kind of a hard, not so much question, but more wondering. Um, and, and some of this might be incorrect, so please correct me. Um, I under, From what I understood, OSPI was adjusting or changing the IEP online system or something like that, right? And so I just, you know, with technology, I kind of wonder, you know, is there a way or have they thought about putting something in the system that triggers the requirement to like fill out a transi transition plan when the student's age who's in the IEP system, you know, turns 16, like, could that be, you know, sort of an easy sort of mechanism for shifting that? Have there been conversations around how the system can change to ensure fidelity? I think that it has, I think it's there, but I'm not sure. So, and I don't know that OSPI has an online IEP that schools use. Schools do their own. Are you Caleb, are you answering that, or were you just raising your finger there? <laughs> I was going to try. Um, introduce hi, yourself thanks. too. I've been I've been saying Caleb, and please introduce yourself. Yes. So um, thanks for having me back. I saw most of you a few weeks ago. Uh, so I'm Caleb Perkins. I work for Seattle Public Schools in College and Career Readiness, and I just appreciate the opportunity to be here to listen. I was invited by Janice, uh, so thank you for including me. But in terms of what you're referencing, there's actually a a bill that looks like it has a better than decent chance to pass about OSPI uh, creating a universal screener that would take the place of all the different districts choosing Naviance or Zello or Career Cruiser what, or what have you. There's obviously pros and cons when the state gets involved in this way. They The language that I see um, that I'm going to put in the chat looks like they're making reference to transition services. I don't know how robust that planning is, I we're, we're eager to see, because if it actually passes the way it's written now, it means we all have to use the same screener eventually. I think it's by 24, 25, um, which means that we're gonna have to be active in making sure this tool has what we want and what we need. So uh, I appreciate the, those specific ideas. We're also considering uh, opening up an RFP for our own to, even if the state doesn't, to revisit the Naviance decision um, and we would welcome your input on how to include criteria that would be helpful for that too. Thank you. 
Uh, this is Sherilyn. Caleb, how would we be able to uh, <clears throat> help you provide criteria on the Naviance or the or a program that does this? Some of this. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm taking notes from this conversation. You, if you don't have my email address, cbperkins at seattleschools.org, my team will be leading the RFP. So we're, we're the ones you want to connect with. Um, but I, I think there's actually a formal process by which we're supposed to post and an issue and get public comment. But um, if for some reason that is, is imperfect, feel free to email me directly. No, actually, the formal process might be beneficial in terms of kind of helping to educate a little bit more and learn a little bit more about Naviance overall. Um, and I will take this, uh, your comment or your, your reply to Yana about the high school and beyond has to happen every year and is tracked. And I appreciate that. Um, when I, you I, have- And I didn't, I don't mean to imply it's a hundred percent, just to be, that that is part of my team's job is to follow up with the, Unfortunately, many schools for many groups of students who are not getting adequate access to those high school and beyond plan lessons. That is what we we issue reports every quarter to our school leaders and their bosses called the directors of schools, indicating uh, how many students have had that opportunity. And that's really basic. That's just like one, two lessons a year. It's not even, it's not the really deep thinking and planning that uh, Cinda has been talking about. The, and you, you somewhat answered what I was going to ask in terms of, you know, my, my, my uh, two, both my kids might have taken that, the one who is um, uh, not receiving special education services, uh, but just like trying to get that feedback and understand it. So it, whether it's, I, what I hear you say is, yes, it's a, it's a bit of a checkbox, but it's also something that you're working on in terms of how you're trying to create something and um parent education the more parent education that we can get as well as then on from what i see um parent agitating for um uh feedback on this you know uh, will help right but it's right. hard to help what we don't know about <laughs> Agreed. And ironically, we got a lot of attention from parents when Naviance was first adopted because of concerns actually about privacy and, and data sharing and things like that. Um, so that was great. I went around the, the district and did sessions um, that interest, you know, again, that that's something we could we could generate. So, um, yeah, especially if we do an RFP, that's that would be great to do. Uh, Sherilyn, and this is Sherilyn, and I will just say uh, if uh, Iona or Deanna or um, Aditi or Marsha, if you would like to add something, we would welcome more voices. And my team's gonna have to jump off here. I think we're at the end of our time, but um, I can stay on for a little bit if there's more questions. Go ahead, Yana. Yeah, I uh, thank you. I'm just going to ask since uh, people are probably thinking their brains are already full. <laughs> and I would like to ask, um, and I would not, I have a one question, uh, but also I want to just, I wanted to share that um, our evaluation team last spring was trying to really hard to convince me that transition service, transition evaluation is not part of triennial reevaluation and they were very confused when i showed legal guidance and ospi guidance on that um and Zinda, you might remember we've emailed a bunch of times about that <clears throat> and in fact the teacher asked the principal who was there um until july to um help him get take some classes over the summer so while my kiddo was evaluated in the, or you know mid early spring or that started then um we are almost done with a uh, transition evaluation with my 11th grader uh, but i will say that at least there is a seriously different information from what we had previously so now we're having to kind of push the team to meet and discuss it we haven't even met to discuss what what's been happening um what's going to happen going forward but I will say that he was 
the special education teacher was excited. I've been sending him all the different um, resources I've gotten from, from you and um, with the support of the principal, the previous principal, he was able to take a couple of classes and go through the modules with my son. I just wish it happened um, three years ago or, or more, but I really wanted to just say thank you for that resource. It's, it was, it makes a difference. I wish that every special education teacher would know about it, that every principal would be encouraging staff to take this. And uh, I guess my question would be, uh, what would your recommendation for the, for not just parents, but for the community be around um, getting the district to do this? You know, I do hope that Dr. Perkins can um, maybe chime in also, but I think it's really important for us to kind of know what can we do to ask for training if we are, we are, I'm saying we, but I'm not, uh, staff, which direction to go other than your principal? And where would you start as a, as a teacher? And where would you recommend the teachers to start? Well, I'll put a little nugget out there first. I think none of us are as powerful as the voice of our youth. So if you can have, if some of your students who have IEPs are able to share their transition plan, are able to talk about what they need, are able to go in and, and bring three teachers together, able to have a panel discussion, we found that students can change teachers and administrators' minds way faster than we can. And I know that's tough um, to find those people, but I just know that hearing from a student really, really makes a difference. So having your, your child, your student at IEP meetings, preparing them ahead of time, um, having them go in and sit down with Caleb and his colleagues and say, you know, I'm 17 years old, I'm leaving high school in two years, and I don't have a plan. That's going to make Caleb, Dr. Perkins sit up and go, uh-oh, more than four teachers trying to get through to him. It's not that he doesn't want to talk to him, but I just know the power of youth voice. So that's just, that's just one thought. Anytime we can get our students, even if they use assistive technology to get that message across, even if they're nonverbal, if they're there, it makes a difference. So get get students involved. Yes, um, Jana, Jana, Jana says her student, her child says that IEP meetings are a waste of time. I agree, but the IEP shouldn't be. It should be their meeting. So um, check out our, our Canvas course on student-led IEP meetings. Uh, we have a whole bunch of opinions on that. That's a whole other training. And I think you are Marsha. If, oh, uh, this is Sherilyn. Marsha, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just sitting in because I am on the governor's committee on disability issues and employment. And we have a um, youth leadership forum every summer. And that is a week long overnight thing. It's we are the only one in the state that can accept medically fragile students. We provide all the support that they need. And so this doesn't have a direct connection with what we do, but it's part of the background for what we do. So I just wanted to get more information on it. And this has been really helpful. Thank you very much. And thank you, Marsha. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about you from my daughter, Linnea Johnson. <laughs> we'll talk okay. about that later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Marcia, thank you for sharing about that. I'll, I want to look that up and see if we can share yeah, that. It's great. Okay. Well, for um, uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth grade parents that are here, really glad you're getting this information. Um, yes, yes. Kind of feeling a little frustrated as a 12th grade parent. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. And this is definitely an area we'll continue to work in. Thank you so much. Thank you. And remember, you are your kids' heroes. You really are. You know them. Um, hang in there and reach out to each other to get the support you need. And 
reach out to us if you can't find the resources you're looking for. And by resources, I don't mean money. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>